when I looked at the work that you were doing was really amazing. Welcome back to the morning news. Welcome back to the morning news. Today we're joined by one of Africa's leading voices in the entertainment industry. We have the talented Leslie Kasumba with us. How are you? I'm good, Adrian. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. And may I just say it's an honor to have you on the podcast today. <laughs> I, <laughs> I actually just don't have any other words. Singer, songwriter, Channel O, BET, Judge, XXL. You, you've done everything. Oh, thank you so much. I was actually Googling a bit about you guys' podcast. I take it seriously when I agree to do an interview because as somebody who does interviews, and I think a lot about what's the interview going to be. So when I looked at the work that you were doing, it was really amazing. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Right into it, may you tell us a bit about who Leslie Kasumba is and about the African Rising Project? Well, who I am is a very complex story. Like my friends and stuff always are like, oh, you should, you should have a movie or like write a book. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, one day. So I'm Cuban born of Ugandan origin, stayed in different parts of the continents, then, you know, ended up in SA. I now live in Ghana. Um, I am a creative industry specialist. So what that means is that I basically work with creatives in the African space because I understand the power of the creative industry. I feel as though a continent or a country without a creative industry is almost like a family without an album. You know what I mean? Whether it's a digital album or whatever the case may be, it really documents yeah. who we are as people. My also, I mean, like you said, I've been a judge for numerous different awards. I was the head of Channel O Africa. The singer songwriting thing, honestly, that was like a moment in time. It's just something mm -hmm. like every time I see it on Wikipedia, I'm like, you know, anyway, Wikipedia can tell many stories. So that's it. And I also have a company, She Speaks Africa, that trades as Africa Whisperer. So I have various clients um, that I do work for around music and strategy and popular culture and just, you know, understanding the continent. And I also am an NAACP judge. <laughs> that's just mm -hmm. what added on this year which is awesome but yeah just different things a girl who basically is just blessed enough to live her dream i guess that's really powerful i'll just always say you are really talented oh and thank you <laughs> your immediate personality uh, magazine editor and judging philanthropist did you always have a passion for entertainment I mean, I don't know if for me it was about entertainment as much as communication. Like, I think ever since I was a child, I kept a journal, you know, like every night I'd write a journal. I haven't written a journal in like a bit now, um, but yeah. I, I'd write a journal every night, just basically talking about my life and all of that. So everything started honestly with the love of words. I won't even lie. It was like, I loved reading words. I loved watching movies and like predicting what the script would be and all of that. So it was kind of that kind of Space. And I also come from a family that's a little bit musical and creative, although at the time I didn't know it. My dad famously played for Miriam McCabe when she was in Uganda, which is so incredible. Every time I hear that, he was part of her band. I'm like, yeah. that's incredible. Um, and then my great grand uncle was responsible for bringing TV into Uganda. So I just didn't know all of those things or that my great grand uncle was like a press officer for like one of the former presidents of Uganda and everything. So there were all of those things that were in my life that I never actually knew, but it seemed like it was in my blood. Um, my aunt in Uganda owns a radio station. And when I say I didn't know, it's because my sisters and I, obviously, we were not in Uganda. We're in and out. And when you're with family, you don't be like, oh, well, what do you do? You know? Yeah. It was just along the way where somebody once asked me. I spoke to one of my uncles and I said, wow, I feel so different from my sisters because they're very academic. And he said, oh, no, you're exactly like the family. Then he brought out all the history books. I'm like, oh, wow, that's incredible. So I think it was ingrained and I think that more than anything when I started specifically with radio and you know doing hip hop and everything my thing was to unite people from different African countries using the genre that I understood and loved the most which was hip hop so you know getting the privilege of being on YFM like my first year out of high school when I was 18 was incredible while studying and then now you know I continue that I just love to communicate I'm an Afro optimist so anything that has to do with like communicating Africa's narrative in multiple ways I enjoy doing it. So I don't know if I'm an entertainer as much as a communicator and a networker and I love having conversations and, and just showing just the beautiful side and the interesting side and all those different dynamic sides of what makes us who we are as Africans.
Africans in general. So I don't know if an entertainer, although I played the piano, you know, <laughs> I do yeah. actually have a piano at my place, but yeah. That's, that's great. It. And you spoke about talent always being in your blood. Are your sisters also in the industry? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so now because my mom is late, there's seven of us. So, and you know, I've got awesome siblings. So, like, my oldest brother is a chemical engineer and then my sister she has like an incredible job she lived in japan for 10 years speaks japanese blah 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 works with like <laughs> government negotiations all these crazy things so she worked with the <laughs> au like she's a serious person you know i mean i don't exactly know what she does but she started international relations and she's always doing diplomacy stuff um and then my other sister is a pharmacist so it's kind of like i that's why i literally felt like i was not like any of my siblings, you know. Um, oddly enough, my younger siblings, um, Nanchinga and Ariab and Mukasa, well, maybe um, Nanchinga more and Ariab, they're more like me. So Nanchinga is like a writer. So I'm, she's always like, she's like me. I'm like, yes, something happened. <laughs> and then my brother Ariab loves his hip hop and he's always, I'm just like, okay. And my dad is like, don't do it. <laughs> but, oh, you uh, want to get into hip hop? He, he enjoys it. I mean, I don't know if he's serious at the moment, but it's just like kind of funny that my other two siblings. <laughs> things are like similar to me you know um although my older sister when we were in school she would make us all like sing on stage so we used to be like sisters singing on stage it was so weird so the creative oh, thing came from her sweet. yeah i just had the courage to follow it through let me say so i think they live vicariously <laughs> through me with ym and how you spoke about your love for hip-hop who are some artists who you've always liked if you're gonna ask african artists i'm not gonna say um, shame. Sto Stogie and them always laugh at me because they know exactly what I'm going to say. They're like, don't ask me that question. But anyway, I'm going to say it. Part of the reason why I never would say who my favorite artists were is that because I feel as though, you know, sometimes you have to understand the weight that you carry. So if I have an influence in terms of who people listen to in hip hop or oh, music yeah. or popular culture, and I go and say that, oh, this is my favorite artist in a particular situation, I feel as though I'm being biased and I want people to have their own views. So with hip hop, I would never say it, you know. Um, I listen to different people for different moods and different ways and different seasons. I'm in my life more than anything. So, yeah. Are you more into old school hip hop or nowadays hip hop? I don't think there's such a thing as old school hip hop, so to speak. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. I just like good hip hop. Like, honestly speaking, that's it. Like, I just like when something is good. And it's it depends on what my mood is, you know. So, on one day, I could be listening to, like, I don't know, like I listen to just everything. It just depends literally where my mood is. So whether I'm listening to Rhapsody or I listen to Cardi, you know, like, I mean, the Cardi thing is quite a hectic thing. My friends are always looking at me like, don't do it. You know, or I'm, <laughs> or I'm more like into J. Cole or do I feel like listening to a Jay-Z or do I want to Kendrick? Like I'm very diverse in terms of my hip hop because I feel as though hip hop has got different moods and different seasons. So if I want to listen to something that is specific and if I wake up in a particular mood, I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to this. I listen to everybody from like Cass to Nadia to whoever, literally, mostly like everybody. But for me, it just depends on my mood. So I don't put hip hop in categories and all of that. I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, old school was better or whatever. I'm just like, yeah. good music is good music. Like, I'm really over it, you know? It depends on how it hits me and how I feel about it, honestly. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And obviously, being a media personality, I believe that comes with a lot of preparation of material and practice. And with that, do you have a set daily routine or does it change day to day? Well, because I've worn so many different hats in media um, and so forth, I think depending on what it is that I'm kind of focusing on. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, let's say, for example, when I'm doing interviews and, and podcasts and all of that, like that's something I take so seriously. Before an interview, I become like overly obsessive with understanding the person. I want as soon as I have the conversation for the person to feel like they've known me for a while, e even though it's, it may be a respectful manner, if it's like a prime minister or whatever the case may be, or an artist, to be respectful, not to be like overly familiar but you just kind of have a rapport so i really prepare for that i prepare my intros i'm like um you know my producer would like laugh because i'd be like i don't have an intro yet and then i'll type it real quick before we go i prepare my intros when i do radio i'm prepared i don't like to freestyle things because i feel like there has to be a level of respect given to the skill you know whatever form you find yourself in the creative industry so whatever i'm doing i always prepare for like later on this morning, I have a voiceover and so I'm going to have to go through the scripts. And when I walk in, you know, I have a level of uh, familiarity with the scripts so that, the, you know, we're not wasting the client's time. So I'm just one of those people. I want to be prepared. And I feel that 
the biggest thing about the creative industry in Africa is that you know we all as creatives as a whole whether you're on radio or you're like a club dj or you're a podcaster or you're a designer whatever it may be a comedian whatever it may be we all need to put in the work and ensure that every time that we put our foot forward we're, we're doing it in excellence because at the end of the no. day in the same way that you won't go to a doctor who's like oh sometimes it's like i don't want that kind of doctor i'll be like nope i am leaving you know, mm-hmm. similarly, I don't want to go to a show with which an artist hasn't prepared for. I don't want to listen to music that they, you know, that an artist is just like whatever about. I don't want to consume content where I feel like as though the person is not even trying. They're just being disrespectful. Similarly, in the same way. So I'm kind of strict where that's concerned. Yeah. You spoke about work and about being in various industries in media. Mm-hmm. And do you think that with all that you've accomplished, your hard work ethic has been a big aid in your success? Hard work ethic or fear of failure, depending on how you look at it. I think more it was like a fear of failure because now I had to be like, I'm doing this thing. I better be (laughs) sure that I'm not embarrassing the whole family, you know? So it was like, yeah, I think my hard work ethic, my fear of failure, but maybe more positively, my certainty of purpose. What makes things work for me like I really excel in places where I feel like there's a purpose so with the Africa State of Mind podcast I could feel the purpose around the podcast so I felt that when I was involved and still am involved with hip hop and everything like I could feel the purpose so I was like you know intense about it when I can feel a sense of purpose about something I go all out I understand that's really powerful and something I really found interesting about Leslie Kasumba was how you emceed for Beyonce and you worked as the head of Channel O in Africa. May you tell us a bit about how that came to be? Wow. So the Beyonce emceeing and all of that stuff, that just came as a result of somebody literally giving me a call. And I was just like, oh, I can do this. What are you talking about? I was just like, <laughs> I mean, what do you mean? You know, um, mm-hmm. some of the other work, like whether it was doing a bit here with Rock Nation here or there, whatever, was just basically based off a reputation and people just saying, oh, this is the person to speak to. Uh, head of Channel O Africa, literally minding my own business. And I just got a call and everybody was like, oh, would you be interested in X, Y, Z? You know, we need to be able to, you know, translate Channel O Africa properly into the East, West and East, West and Central African region. So that's the, the territory I looked after. So it was just basically, I got a call each time. I think sometimes when you work hard and your reputation speaks for you, people will just remember you in amazing ways. And I've just been blessed that I get remembered in the craziest way. I mean, last year when I was, I remember it was a Sunday morning and I was like lying down and I get a message saying, oh, do I want to be an NAACP award judge? You know, the like biggest awards for like African American. I was just like, eh? Literally, I got a message from a number I didn't know. I was like, wow, this is incredible. And somebody had referred me. So all of those things, Uh it's just like, I think it's in part, like, I feel like God really favors me. So I feel so humbled with that. I think it's also got a lot to do with what your career and how you treat people and and just, you know, what it is that you do uh, that also brings opportunities to you. So a lot of things have honestly just dropped on my lap. I don't want to lie. But as a result of work that I've done in the past. That's really great. And I believe what you are saying about God, about how if you put in the work, it will come. And as long as it's in God's will. And as a person who believes in helping others and pushing the African narrative Mm. forward, what keeps you going when things get tough in your industry? Well, you know, the toughest thing about the creative industry is the emotions and the mentality and the weight that you carry as a creative, right? Because your work is automatically judged. It's like a very quick, like, oh, it's nice, it's not. Like, that's the nature of the industry. Do you get what I mean? Um, yeah. and, and when you put your heart into something, you know, even like as a journalist, because, you know, that's what I studied and I did that for quite a bit. So when you put your heart into something and you have to throw it out there, It's almost like every time you put yourself out creatively, it's like giving the world a piece of yourself. And I think that that's the hardest part. And having to get around the mentality of like, wow, Leslie, like don't even be putting this extra amount of pressure, you know, on yourself. I think the hardest part for me of the creative industry is not like when 
jobs are scarce or anything like that. I don't think of that because I don't think in a scarcity mentality or challenges. And I know it's been very challenging for the last year and, and a bit now for people across the board. So I'm not being disrespectful, but I think it's more that when you get rejected or get overlooked or don't get the response that you want, it feels like a bit of yourself is being somebody saying they don't like you. And that's the hardest part about yeah. being a creative. So whether you're a painter or a designer or a sculptor or a film director, or whatever the case you may be it just feels like a little part of you is being rejected and i think that that's what the hard thing is i understand and obviously with my little podcast it's um, not a little podcast even... it's incredible honestly <laughs> <laughs> um even when you send messages it's not like everyone will reply but something that i've learned to do is to not focus on the nose but to focus on the one yes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and whenever i try to do a podcast i always prepare and i want it to be the best material that i can do and i've seen that even with podcasts and all sometimes someone can reject it they might not reply but after they listen to something they'll be like oh sure we can have it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a really big positive i've taken from it no i mean and that's such a good mentality to have you know um you focus on the yeses if somebody says no you know, sometimes like there could be so much going on in somebody's life as to why they said no. And then also, you know, to be really honest, I think it's like sometimes when it comes to just interviews and everything, people are so guarded because you never know what the intent behind the interview is going to be. What are people going to say? How are you going to feel afterwards? You know, and I think that that sometimes is what delays people in saying yes. So people want to listen and to see what your work uh, intention is going to be. They want to be like, what's the intent of your work? And then they will kind of agree. So that people take time to research. So I've had situations where I've been hit up by people and I don't know the podcast and I'm just like, oh my gosh, should I do it? And either based on the way that they wrote to me or based on like seeing somebody that I know as part of it, whatever the case may be, based on any of that, I literally just gravitate towards it. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give it a chance, you know? So yeah, I definitely think that intent is is like a hundred percent, but you're so right. Don't focus on the nose, you know? (laughs) I think something we all have to learn is like, it's not about you. It's not that personal. It's like, it's not personal. Like my sister always says to me, she like, you know, because my sisters are serious. So my my sister who's a pharmacist, I tease, I'm like, you're like a scientist. So you don't understand. She always says to me, oh, Leslie, you know that there are people who are hungry in the world. I'm like, yeah, but listen, (laughs) she just like looks at me like, what do you mean? You know? (laughs) So, I mean, also having people who are not that much connected in that, although they care about you, you know, they always like just make you like spotlight and like, listen, this really happened. Somebody lost X amount. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And with family, I believe that supportive friends and a supportive family unit around you can help in support of your goals and help with your vision. Mm -hmm. And with that, who are the three people who have been most influential to you on your journey? Ah, I can't say that. You're probably going to be like, Lee, you don't answer anything. Let me tell you why I can't say it. It's because I feel as though at different times in my life, in different seasons, I've had so many incredible people support me when I felt like I wasn't going to be able to continue, when I was feeling unsure, all of that stuff. I've had so many people support me, you know? So at different times, my sisters have been the ones who have been like, whoa, my biggest cheerleaders, like, they said what? They did what? To who? We're getting them. And other times, it's been like my dad, you know, obviously he was the closest person to me. And he's been like, uh, you know, my nabunia, like, just this, you know, care. And other times, like, my older brother, he's also stepped in in different ways. You know, I've had that. I've had, I have friends who are like, just wow, incredible, that will be on other sides of the world. They'll just think of me, they'll call me they'll pray for me they'll just be supportive i've had bosses who have just been like spoken life into me so it's really been all of that like i've been honestly blessed enough to have different people support me differently at different times in my life i don't even want to lie that's really good to have people around you who want the best for you and where can our listeners connect with you online Oh my gosh. So for now, I'm going to say, if you can listen to the podcast, Africa State of Mind, I know it's a bit dated now. We haven't recorded in a year, but you know, after that, I'm, go- I'm going to be launching something else. So just get familiar with the Africa State of Mind content. Um, my Instagram, I'm also getting redone just because I get so busy working that I'm just like, you know, I'm like, okay. Um, but yeah, I would just say basically Africa State of Mind um, on Instagram, on Twitter, LinkedIn. It's Lee Kasumba, L-E-E-K-A-S-U-M-B-A. And yeah, I mean, hopefully, to be really honest, that 
my next chapter and the next work that I do will speak in volumes enough for me that people will be able to find me easily. Yeah, I, I, I feel, I feel like as though your gift should make room for you. I'm not the greatest hyper of myself, but I like people to come back and say, wow, Lee, when you did that, that was great. Like, that's what I hope. It's a big thing where people who you might not necessarily know reach out to you and be like, you know, this really helped me. I was going through this and I heard this and it really helped me. I think that's what gives you back the feeling of I'm doing something good. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like you, you nailed it. There's an African proverb that says, smooth seas don't often make skillful sailors. And with that, I believe that you've obviously had a lot of challenges. And may you tell us about a challenge you've encountered and what you learned from it? I mean, I've had so many challenges and everything, you know, like across the board. I don't know if one was harder than the other, but the one that has been the most impactful was obviously losing my mom. The day before my birthday, on her birthday, that was challenging because for years and years, it's like every time it was my birthday, I was just like, oh, wow, you left me on my birthday. You know what I mean? Like the day before my birthday, I'm like, really, this is when you're going to die. And it was on her birthday. So that has been the hardest thing, just getting past that. You know, even as as a grown up, it's just like, wow, you know, it sits in my mind. So every time my birthday comes about, I'm just like, (gasps) okay, you know what I mean? But what's been really helpful is just like being honest with how you feel and dealing with my emotions as I deal with them and just speaking to people and and knowing that we don't always have to have it all together all the time but it'll be okay I feel like even though it was tough when it happened you have to always look at the positive even if it's really little and you can think of it as you might have lost your mom on earth but now you have an angel that's always looking after you and maybe even some of the opportunities that you get is because she's watching over you she's protecting you she's directing you and i feel like that's how you have to look because there's life in there that's so powerful i'm not i'm not even going to add to it that's so powerful nobody's ever said that to me that's powerful (laughs) thank you for that that's probably the most comforting thing that i've heard (laughs) for the gas my mom thank (laughs) you as an altruistic entertainer what advice would you give to someone trying to pursue a similar career path i would say only do it if you know that you're called i would say only do it if you know that you're called if you're doing it for hype and everything don't do it know that you have a purpose and you're called for it because if you do anything outside of purpose and calling and god's will for your life it's going to destroy you that is so powerful (laughs) i would never have done this if i wasn't called for it i feel like if you want to do something and you still need someone else to motivate you someone else to push you to do it then you shouldn't do it because when you have a calling you you have the drive in yeah. you even though you have challenges you don't see challenges as challenges you see them as a way to success if that makes yes, sense yes definitely <laughs> definitely <laughs> and i think the final question i'll ask today is on the podcast we have a signature question so today i'd like to ask you leslie kusumba what does happiness mean to you purpose i feel like there has to be purpose in everything purpose in relationships purpose in love purpose in work purpose in the blessings that you get just purpose honestly if i'm fulfilling purpose and call i'm happy and with that i'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us on the morning news today it was a pleasure getting to talk to you (laughs) thank you thank you thank you guys for listening i hope you enjoy it